So we're going to get a 15 minute game and you guys see I have 15 minutes on my clock. We're going to start by playing the most common move in chess, which is e4. Um, the purpose of the opening is to bring your pieces out. The object of the game of chess is to checkmate the king, as you guys know. Uh, checkmate is a situation where the king is being attacked and has no squares to go to. So he plays the Karakhan, uh, which is the name of this opening where he plays c6. Let's play d4. So we grab the center with our pawns, and he's probably going to do the same, d5. Um, now, almost all chess openings have names. They can be named after people. They can be named after cities or chess players or even mythical beings. Most of the time, they're named after people. So Karo was a person and Khan was a person. So it's hyphenated Karo Khan. And uh, black controls the center with his pawn. And if you notice, black is attacking our pawn on e4. So we need to do something with that. Um, white has a bunch of possible options. Here we could get the knight out to c3. We could play e5. That's the advanced Karo Khan. Thank you, unconventional. Or we could take on d5. But one line that often flies under the radar is what's called the fantasy variation. Um, I'm a big fan of it. I recommend it to uh, a lot of beginners and club players. The fantasy variation is the move f3, which just defends the pawn on e4. You're not allowing black to win your pawn. And the purpose of the fantasy is to preserve your pawn center. Uh, the purpose of the fantasy is to preserve your pawn center. Um, yeah, I, I actually don't know how it got the name fantasy variation. So our opponent takes on e4, and believe it or not, that's not a mistake, but if he doesn't follow this up correctly, it's going to end up being a bad move. So here we have a pawn trade. We've got two pawns in the center, and he does follow it up correctly with e5. So this may seem, if you're looking at this for the first time, like a blunder. It may seem like, wait a second, we can just take the pawn with our pawn. But as I indicated, it's very, very important in the opening not to forget that if you don't develop any of your pieces, you're going to end up in trouble. And this is a great example of this. If we just blindly take the pawn, who can tell me what black plays in that position? How does black punish the greediness after d takes e5? Isn't it weak to move the pawn protecting the diagonal? No, e5 is pretty common. The king is going to castle probably. Yeah, queen h4 check is correct. So this check on h4 with the queen is called a fork. A fork is when one piece attacks two or more pieces at the same time, including the king. So the queen will be checking the king and attacking this pawn on e4 at the same time. So we need to prevent black's queen from coming to h4. From coming to h4. In order to do that, we don't just want to do that by pushing out a pawn. We want to do that by developing a piece, and that can be accomplished with knight f3. Of course, black can take our pawn on d4. Bishop to g4 instead by our opponent. Now he develops the bishop. Still, taking on e5 is not a great idea. Now the reason isn't that he has a check on h4, because he doesn't. But d takes e5 also allows a queen trade, which is very unpleasant. That brings our king out into the center. We don't want to do that. Now, if we think about this for a second, um, okay, is black actually threatening anything? Maybe he wants to take the pawn, but that's not such a big deal. Our goal in this position is to develop our pieces as actively as possible and to very quickly prepare castling the king. Castling is, is a move in chess when the king is tucked into the, this side of the board. If you think about where to put this bishop, you have a couple of squares. There's e2, there's d3, there's c4. What is the most active square for the bishop? 420 from Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you. The move is bishop c4 because the bishop immediately aims at the f7 square. This is the weakest pawn slash the weakest square on the chessboard. Very good. Um, and this is a super sharp opening. There's a lot going on. We want to castle. We also have some sacrifices at the ready on f7. He goes knight to d7. That is correct. And uh, now we need to complete our development by castling. Now we want to complete it. Well, not complete our development, but continue our development by castling. This is the Karokan. Um, now, what you guys should notice, particularly if, you know, you're not too familiar with chess or with these lines, notice how we're both bringing our pieces out. And notice how the bishop on c4 is aiming at this pawn. And the rook that's sitting here on f1 is also aiming at that pawn. Now, obviously, there's a knight in the way, but the knight is easy to move. That's our knight. We can move it. And if we move our knight, that f7 pawn is going to be under a lot of fire. So black has to be super careful here. 
Thank you, Ola Pals, gifting to Puree Fish. Okay, so our plan in the next couple of moves is going to be to pile up in every way that we can on this F7 pawn. Yeah, that would be me, Tanguido. Yeah, and by the way, guys, those of you, again, who are not as familiar, uh, if you're not following, that's okay, because after the game, I'm going to go through every move very slowly, and I'm going to explain all of the logic. Uh, and that's going to be more oriented toward beginners, uh, because I know a lot of you are sticking around from Charlie's stream. I really appreciate that. And I know it can be hard to follow when I'm making moves quickly. Uh, so I try to cater to all levels. All right. This is a mistake. So what he's done just now is a big mistake. Why is it a mistake? Because he doesn't defend the pawn that I've highlighted in, in blue. That pawn, which I had previously indicated, is not very well protected. It's only defended by the king, and the king is a very bad defender because once the king is out in the open, there's a greater probability of checkmating it. And we have a very typical idea uh, that allows me to get a crushing attack against this king. We sacrifice the bishop on f7. To sacrifice a piece means to give it away. Bishops are obviously we, uh, stronger than pawns, so we have given up a bishop for a pawn, but we've gotten something in return, as you guys will see. This is totally crushing. Now, when he takes our bishop with his king, which he doesn't have to do, but if he does, he moves into the path of this rook. What does that mean? That means if we move away the knight, it's going to be a check. That's called a discover check. So we're going to move the knight away. That rook is going to be checking the king, and we're going to get a crushing attack. And we're going to win his bishop back at the same time. And we're going to win his, win his bishop back at the same time. So if I were black, I would go king to e7. I wouldn't take the bishop, although he's still losing. Yeah, discover checks are among the most are among the strongest ideas that you have at your disposal. When you move a piece out of the way of another piece and that results in check, you can wreak total havoc on your opponent. Um, so this is awesome. Among Us, yeah. Oh, because there's some overlap in terminology. So this is absolutely crushing. Now, I hope I'm making sense, by the way. He can either move the king past the bishop or he can take the bishop. He's taking his time. Either way, this is crushing, crushing, crushing. King f8. So he moves the bishop, the king, and I call this the umbrella method. He uses the bishop almost as an umbrella, uh, hiding behind it, which is kind of annoying. And uh, we got to do something about it. So what should we do about it? Um, well, there's a couple of things. See, the problem is if that bishop weren't there, then we would be able to move the knight with a discovered check. If we move the knight here then we will drop our queen, and we don't want to give away our queen. If we take his knight with our bishop, he's going to take with the king, and the king is going to be sheltered from any discovered checks. So we got to tone things down a little bit. We got to take a step back and say, all right, let's make a simple move. Let's get our bishop away from, uh, away from f7. But then comes the next question. Where should we put this bishop? You can put this bishop on b3. You can put it on c4. But if you're already bringing the bishop back, perhaps we can distract him. Perhaps we can make a move that forces him to react. And by reacting, he's going to be unable to get this king away from f8. What square am I talking about? Yeah, so either bishop h5 or, even better, bishop to e6. That's a pretty sexy move. We're sacrificing our bishop again. But if he takes it, then his king is going to be directly in the line of fire of the rook. That's the bottom line. He can defend with bishop takes knight. That would probably be the best move. But he's still going to be in very big trouble. Goes knight f6. That's a good thought. He covers up the rook, but he forgets about his bishop. Now we just take his bishop. He loses a piece. If he takes back, then he exposes himself once again to a discovered check. So hopefully this is making some sense. Another thing to notice this king and this queen, where are they located? They are a knight's distance away. So already you should be envisioning a scenario where this knight lands on that green square because that will be a fork to the king and the queen. That will win the queen. Now we need to ask ourselves how the knight can get there. How can the knight get to this green square as quickly as possible, the blue square, whatever, <laughs> quickly as possible? Well, we can go to g5, that's a check. If the king moves, then he loses the knight. 
uh, and checkmate will follow. If he covers that check with his knight, as he just did, then there's a fork. Knight e6 check and the game is basically over. We won his queen. And when you lose your queen in chess for no uh, compensation or no other pieces, the game is basically over. Oats, thank you for the five gifted. I really appreciate it. Taking his queen. And now we are up a full queen for a piece. How should we proceed? We should simply complete our development. Nothing particularly crazy uh, that we should do here. Uh, before we do anything, this pawn on d4, uh, I want to make sure that it's well protected. So um, we can take on e5, but that would open up a little file for his rook. Could we perhaps support this pawn with another pawn? Is that possible? Can we try that? How can we do that? We can play the move c3. c3 just to build up a little pawn chain, making sure that our center remains intact. Some of you may say, wait a second, doesn't he take this free pawn over here? Well, if he does that, I'll talk about what we can do. <sighs> okay. I know there's a lot to talk about. He goes rook d to f8. Thank you, call me Haji for the prime. All right. So he contests the, the file. And uh, all we need to do now, our center is safe. We need to complete our development. Look at the bishop, look at the knight. They're still on their initial squares. Uh, that's not a good thing. They're not doing anything. First, we need to deal with the bishop. What can the bishop do? Well, the bishop has a super nice square on g5 where it's pinning the knight. And a pin is a situation where one piece is creating a situation where another piece can't really move. The knight literally cannot move because you cannot expose your king to an attack. And that's called a pin. Thank you, Shamrock69, for the five. And the support today has been unreal. Thank you, folks. I appreciate it, Shamrock. You are the man. And another sub, Ole Pals, gifting to Barker Bone. Thank you for the fat 10 gift subs. Love it. Nah, it's easy. My job is easy given this level of support. So bishop to g5. We still have to develop our knight. And we're going to bring it out here to d2. And maybe later on to c4. So another thing to point out. When you're up material. And in chess, when you say material, that just means the overall collection of pieces you have. So if you're up material, that means you have more pieces than your opponent. Not necessarily literally. But you could have a queen and your opponent could have a knight for that queen and you're still up material. So when you're up material, a very common piece of chess wisdom says that you should trade pieces. Um, and the analogy that I've thought of is like, if a soccer player gets a red card and he gets ejected from the game, um, you have 11 players against 10, right? And then some genie walks up to you and says, I'm gonna make you an offer. Uh, you remove... 10 players on your team and the opposing team removes 10 players on their team. But of course, one of their players got a red card. So you get a situation where it's literally one player against zero. And would you take that deal if you were the team with 11 players? Obviously you would. It would be easy to score a goal. Um, and when you're up a queen, if you trade all of the other pieces, you're literally just gonna have a queen and maybe some pawns against a king and some pawns. And that's much easier to win than if there's a bunch of other pieces complicating the game. I know it's a far-fetched analogy, but maybe it helps people see why this is inherently good. So in this situation, we have a possibility of trading two equivalent pieces. We can trade a bishop for a knight. The question is, do we want to do that? Well, if we follow that advice, yes, we should. Bishop takes knight. Thank you, Toblanders, for the five. I cannot keep up with all these subs. This is crazy. All right, knight takes f6. Now... We still need to develop this knight, right? We still need to develop this knight. Let's do that. Let's go knight d2. We also protect the pawn. Uh, so his knight can't take it. His knight can't take the pawn because it's protected. All right. Um, so if we have a queen for two pieces, should we exchange other pieces? Yeah, you could. Now, when I share chess wisdom, and again, this is more geared to toward those of you who don't have much chess experience, um, when I share these pieces of advice, you got to understand that this isn't always the case. There are situations when trading is bad, even if you're up a queen. So there are exceptions to the rules, but when you're just starting to play chess, the best thing to do, thank you for the sub KCP, the best thing to do is to learn the principles and the rules because they're going to guide your play. They're going to make you a little bit less overwhelmed. And then when you get better and better and more experienced, you start learning about when the rules have exceptions and 
you know, you start learning more deeper rules and stuff like that. Now, notice that we have a queen for a bishop. Why do you keep referring to the horse as a knight? Because in chess, this is called the knight. It, it is literally a horse, but uh, the proper term for it is a knight. So we can do a couple of different things. Look at our queen. Is the queen doing anything right now? Our extra queen isn't doing anything. I don't like that situation. It's a pony. Yeah, exactly. According to Hikaru. Okay, so he's played g5. This doesn't do very much. Um, now, another important concept in chess is the concept of a weak square. This is a little bit advanced, but a weak square is a square that cannot be protected by pawns. So by playing g5, he's created a very big weak square. And one of your pieces that occupies that square is called an outpost. An outpost is a piece that occupies a very weak square. So notice how his two pawns have passed the sixth rank. And so this f5 square is weak. It's not protected by any pawns, and it cannot be protected by any pawns because pawns cannot go backward. These two pawns are protecting these squares on the fourth rank, but not the squares on the fifth rank. So we need to ask ourselves, can we get a piece to this square? And the answer is yes. We can put a rook here. What is the rook doing? The rook is attacking the e5 pawn. We're trying to get him to take our d4 pawn. If he does that, I'll explain why that's good for us. We could have also tried to put the knight on that outpost. We could have done what's called a knight maneuver. Maneuver is just a sequence of moves with one piece. Um, knight c4, knight e3, knight f5. That was also possible, but this is even faster. Um, so he's taken the pawn. And many of you guys might be tempted to take back. But in chess, you always got to look for better moves, even when there's a tempting move. If you notice the bishop and the knight, they're on forkable squares. They're one square apart. We've had this situation before. We can't give a knight fork, but the knight is not the only piece that can give a fork. Here we play the move e5. The bishop and the knight are hanging, and the rook, most importantly, is defending that pawn, so his bishop can't take it. His bishop can't take it. I know that many of you are... I, I'm not usually at this level of simplicity, but I... Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of people from, from Charlie's stream and stuff, so I'm I'm sorry to those of you who, you know, for whom this is really basic. Uh, you know, once we continue the speedrun, we'll be back at, like, 1800 and stuff. Thanks for being chill about it. Appreciate it. Okay, so he's taken our pawn. Now, we can recapture his pawn, but that would not be a good idea, because then the bishop could move out to c5 and deliver a check. We would have to move our king... And then he could move his knight, and then, you know, the fork kind of evaporates. So instead of that, we want to take either his bishop or his knight first. That's a check. He has to respond to the check, and then we can deal with this pawn. But we don't even have to deal with the pawn. Again, notice how I'm always looking for a better move. I'm seeing the tempting move, which is just to take the pawn back. But then I'm saying, wait a second, is there anything better in this position? And I'm noticing that the queen is X-raying the king. So this knight could move out and deliver a discovered check. Not just any discovered check, it could deliver a double check. Double check is when two pieces are checking the king at once. And the double checks are great because they cannot be blocked. When you deliver a double check, the king has to move. And so this is a great example of a double check. The knight is checking the king and the queen is checking the king. So the king has to move and we're going to ensnare the king in a mating attack or we're going to win a bunch of other pieces. All right, so in this position, we could take a free knight, but before we even take that knight, we could make yet another intermediate move. What other intermediate move could we make to bring another piece into attacking position? Yeah, so the great move, queen d6, that's a check. He can't take the queen because it's protected by the knight. He's got to move the king back. Then we take the knight, and the game is basically going to be over um, because we're going to be up a queen, a knight, and we're going to have a mating attack, so... Okay, so just king b6. Um, yeah, so we could go after the king immediately. We could go for checkmate. But let's play it simple. Let's just take a free knight and then go for checkmate after that. Okay. I'm going to have to run to the uh, bathroom real fast after this game, guys. So you're going to have to give me 30 seconds. I'm going to make it quick. So what should we do now? We have checkmate in two moves. 
We have checkmated to me. You know what? I'm going to run to the bathroom during the game. So I, I'm going to let you guys think about the mate. I'll be back in one minute. You have one minute to find the checkmate. When I'm back, I will do the big reveal. White to play and checkmate in two moves. It's a pretty nice one. Time for the reveal. John of the Raid. Thank you. Time for the reveal, guys. Check on D7. That's a check to the king. The king has to move. And then the queen. And this is the move that's hard to see. Thank you, John. Welcome, guys. I got a Charlie raid earlier. This chat is hopping right now. Thank you, Redempty, for the four months. Boom goes the dynamite. Thank you, Ocho Mampeso. And that's a checkmate. Why is it a checkmate? Because the king can't go to this side of the board. That rook covers the king. The knight covers this square. And the queen is actually doing the checking. Thank you, Big Alex, for the bits. And Clark Payne for the three months. I appreciate it. Um, knight d5 would not have been made in two. Because if we did this, then the knight blocks the rook's axis to b5. All right. So let's quickly go over the game. Good game. Good game, Overcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're getting... So much support here. I love seeing this. Now, by the way, I'll just do a little bit of a pitch. If you're from Charlie's stream, you like this kind of content, you want to get into chess, there's a lot of resources out there these days online. Um, one of them, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, you can just search up my name on YouTube. And this type of speed run, where I play these slow games and explain all the moves, there's over 50 of those types of videos on my YouTube together with other content. So I would be honored if you gave me a sub. Um, but only if, obviously, uh, if, if you like this kind of content and you want more of it, no pressure. <laughs> um, thank you. Well, I, I don't compare to Charlie, um, but, you know, but, but uh, I try my best to make videos for beginners, for intermediate players. So wherever you are uh, on the chess experience level, um, there's going to be videos for you. Okay, and now I will stop annoying you with... Um, Stop annoying you with uh, YouTube sales pitches and let's go over the game. All right, so E4 is what I played and Overcast, you played C6. This is called the Karokan. Now, the two most common chess openings are the symmetrical move E5, the King's Pawn game. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. And then C5, which is called the Sicilian defense. Uh, it's called the Sicilian defense, I think, because uh, either there was a tournament in the Italian region of Sicily or there was a chess club there that sort of pioneered this line first. Thank you, Oats, for the gift to E Crusher BS. Um, and the Karakan is a super reputable opening. If you've seen Queen's Gambit, uh, you probably remember Benny Watts kind of trash talking the Karakan, but among Grandmasters, it's, it's a very good opening. It's considered very reputable. Um, and what's the purpose behind this move? Like, this looks like a weird move. Well, black is just preparing to grab the center with d5. Um, black's preparing. Uh, we hold much disdain for Charlotte. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, lots of things, but I might talk about that later. Uh, but black is preparing d5. So you might be like, well, why doesn't black just play here immediately? Like, why prepare it? Well, the bottom line is that after I take the pawn, you have to take it with the queen. This is called the Scandinavian. The person who just raided me, John, um, he's a good friend of mine. He's a big fan of this opening. But for beginners, it's not the best opening because you're not supposed to bring your queen out early. What happens when you do is that you allow your opponent to get the pieces out with tempo. With tempo just means while attacking other pieces. So knight c3 happens. This is an okay opening, but only if you know exactly how to play. So that's why c6 makes sense. You're preparing d5. So I decided on the fantasy variation, f3. The most common lines here are to take on d5, to push the spawn forward. That's called the advanced variation. Thank you, albino, rhino, giant <laughs> for the prime. And uh, knight to d2 or knight to c3. Those are the three most common lines. Um, instead, I played the fantasy, which is f3. Okay, so d takes c4 is fine. That's one of the possible moves. Thank you, risky play for the prime. Appreciate all the subs, guys. This is awesome. Um, now, black has a bunch of possible variations here. Um, one of the points behind the fantasy is that if black just gets the knight out to f6, this is not a great move. Who can tell me why? This move looks very natural. Okay, you're just developing your knight. What could be wrong with that? But it turns out that this is not a good move. 
because now white pushes e5, attacking the knight. The knight has to move back to an awkward spot, for example, here. Notice how now the knight is blocking in the bishop, and then you can really solidify your central control with f4. Notice how white has only pushed pawns, but white has built up a beautiful pawn center, even visually, and then the knight's going to come out to f3. Uh, so black has lost a bunch of tempi, his position's passive. So black has to know what to do here. This isn't an opening you could just waltz into. D takes e4 is fine. So the way that overcast, the way that you played is completely legitimate. This is a good line. And again, the reason that we can't take the pawn is because of this super nasty check, which actually, which also operates as a fork. If we block the check, boom, queen takes e4, another fork, and now the rook is lost. So that's not good. And so we, we got to develop our knight. And in one of the main lines, if black takes this pawn, we don't recapture. We don't recapture with a knight. We don't recapture with a queen. The fantasy variation is a very tactical line. You're, you're ready and willing to sacrifice pawns in order to develop your pieces quickly. And if you are paying careful attention to the way that the game is going, you should already have an inkling about what white should do here. We should continue developing our pieces, disregard the pawn, get this bishop out to c4. What's the idea? The idea is to immediately pile up on this pawn. Now, a uh, quick little overview of board geography for those of you who are new to the game. What I'm drawing with my vertical arrows are called files. In Russian, you can literally call them a vertical, but in English, they're called files. The horizontal parts of the board are called ranks. And files are very important because they can be used as a conduit from your position to your opponent's position. You could put rooks and queens on files because they are the only types of pieces that move in a straight line or that control squares in a straight line. And in chess, there's a very important concept of open files. An open file, every when the game begins, every file is closed. What does it mean for a file to be closed? It means there are pawns on every single file. As soon as a pawn disappears from a file, that file becomes semi-open. If both pawns disappear from a file, it becomes open. A semi-open file is a file that only benefits one player. And here's the, the, the cool part. If your pawn disappears from a file, that could benefit you. Why? Because if we fast forward now uh, to this position, this f2 pawn has disappeared from this square. So when we put a rook on f1, that rook is unobstructedly... That's not even a word. Um, it's 2 a.m. I'm exhausted. That rook is um, is staring at this f7 pawn, and it's not blocked by your own pawn on f2. But you guys get what I'm trying to say. Um, if we started with no pawns, it would be crazy. Uh, craziness would ensue. So just a little quick overview into files and how they work. I hope I just made sense. Um, please don't feel uh, shy about asking questions, even if you're a beginner. Uh, everyone's always welcome, so uh, I want to make sure everybody understands what I'm saying. Unobstructedly is a word, apparently. Yeah, so bishop g4 is my opponent's my opponent's response. Now, um, this is this would be very dangerous. Now, the move that I recommend to Karokan players, this is a slightly more advanced point, is bishop to e6, developing the bishop, but not to where he developed it, rather developing it to to the red square. Thank you, uh, Minambo Jambo for the prime. What's the purpose of this weird developing move? Well, the first thing to understand, doesn't this just hang a pawn? Doesn't this allow us to take the pawn? Well, if you remember previously, now you have this check on h4 again. You win back the pawn with interest. So you can't take that pawn with a knight. You can take it with a pawn, but that allows a queen trade, forces the king out to the open file, and gives black a super comfortable game for the pawn. When you have a lot of stuff in return for the pawn, when you've got, you know, an attack, for example, that's called compensation. You have compensation for the pawn. That just means you've got stuff going on in the position that gives you enough, uh, you know, that, that can be used in regular English, too, enough compensation for the pawn. Thank you, Mick Finnegan, for the prime. So we don't want to take this pawn with either piece. Instead, we want to do what we did in the game, but much later, which is to play c3, uh, supporting our central pawn so that if he takes, we could simply recapture with a pawn. And the game goes on. Black goes knight d7 and develops the knight. We develop the bishop. Black develops the knight. Both sides complete their development. I just think that this is a very solid line for black, which uh, won't allow you to get blown off the board. So back to the game. Bishop g4, bishop c4. Very dangerous move, aiming at the f7 pawn. 
This also creates a threat. And in chess, a threat, just like it is in real life, is something that if uh, your opponent doesn't stop you, you're going to do and cause damage. This move creates a threat. So let's make a random move for black to understand what the threat is. To understand what the threat is, you need to understand two, two subsequent things, two preliminary things. The first is the purpose of this move, which as I explained is to aim at this very weak pawn on f7. The second thing to understand is that this bishop on g4 is undefended. That means it has no pieces or pawns that are protecting it, which means that it's incredibly vulnerable to things like a fork, right? Now, you might look at this and say, okay, so let's take on e5, let's, let's attack the bishop, but it's too early for that because the knight is pinned. If you move the knight, you lose your queen. You can't do that. What you can do is you can take on f7 with the bishop, sacking it, luring the king to f7. Now, after knight takes e5, wait, we're blundering the queen? But no, we're not. The king is now in check. And we forked that very same bishop, which is unprotected. So this is a very common pattern. And if you're a beginner and you're feeling overwhelmed, remember that when you learn this stuff, you learn patterns. You might have a completely different position, but you might still find an idea of this sort, uh, even if it's wearing completely different clothes. So you learn by acquiring patterns, and then pattern recognition kind of set, sets in after you become more experienced. So knight to d7 is a good move from that perspective. Now you might ask, well, wait a second, why can't we do the same thing? Okay, let's try. Takes f7. Looks like we can do the same thing. We can just take on e5. We're, we're in great shape. But no, he takes on e5. And the problem is that our queen is hanging. And that very same knight is protecting the bishop. So we lose not one, but two pieces. That's way too much to give up. A slightly more advanced question. What about this move? Why can't we give this check? Because, hey, the knight is protected by the bishop. The king has to move. And then we take the bishop. And we're up a pawn. And the king is terrible. But that's not right because the queen can take the knight. The point is that white's queen is hanging as well, uh, and this creates a situation where both queens are hanging. If we take black's queen, he takes our queen. We've sacrificed two pieces, he's only given up one, and so black is up a piece here. This is unfortunately insufficient. Um, so we can't take here. For that reason, we have to play patiently, and for that reason, we castled. This reinforces the threat of bishop takes f7 by creating a rook x-ray against that square. And in this position, a decisive mistake was made by our opponent. Bishop to d6, it's good from a general level, it's a development move, but it's bad specifically because it does not protect uh, this pawn from the x-ray of the rook. How should black have developed to protect the pawn from the rook's x-ray? What should black have played here? Yes, knight f6 is correct. Thank you for the sub, tell the mama. Knight f6 is correct. And so, once again, after takes takes, we can move our, we can do this, but it doesn't do anything because there's a knight on f6. If there was no knight on f6, this would have been a double check, as it was in the game. Um, I almost played knight f6, but was scared of d takes e5. Thanks for letting me know. Who can tell me how black can solve this situation? What should black do here? Because indeed, if you take on e5 with a knight, then we take the queen first, and then that's a free knight. But black is an intermediate move that's very important. What can black do before taking on e5? No, it's black to play. So we're asking, what happens if I take his pawn? Black can take the knight first. He takes the knight first. Um, we have to respond to that because the queen is going to be hanging. And after we take the bishop, then he takes the pawn. The knight is now, is now safe. And this creates a little mini fork against white's bishop. Black is in great shape here. White doesn't have to lose a piece. We can swing the queen around and protect the bishop. But black's got a great developing game here. Bishop c5 check is also possible. You can start with this check. That's, that's true. And then you have, you can, but, but you'll have to do the same thing. So... Looking for intermediate moves is very important in such positions. And here, once we take on f7, the game is over. Because, basically over. Because if he takes the bishop, we take on e5, that's a double check, then we take the bishop. Um, chess speedrun, yeah, sure. So in a chess speedrun, I start with a rating of zero. I basically start from a beginner's chess rating. 
and I climb all the way up to master or grandmaster level. Now, I have a normal account where my rating is reflective of the average rating of a grandmaster. In a speedrun, I start from scratch and build my way upward so that I can experience playing beginners, right? Normally, I don't play beginners, but in a speedrun, I play beginners to explain the method that I use to beat them, basically. Um, so we have questions. Doesn't queen b6 work? Um, queen b6 is fine, but again, after king h1... Oh, yeah, you can, you can do that. Yeah, that's possible. This is also possible because now the queen can no longer be captured. Good. Great catch. Um... So he has to sidestep the check. So king f8 was a good move. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite cut it. And this move, bishop e6, was the decisive move. Uh, but there's this one thing to unpack here. Let's say he had accepted the sacrifice. Could somebody remind me what white's idea is and why it may seem like this actually fails for white? White's next move is pretty obvious. But after that, black has a very strong response, or so it seems. So knight g5, exposing the attack against the king, it may seem, oh, he has to cover the check. Then we take the bishop much like we did in the game, and that's a fork, and that's a win. But uh, he can play king e7. He can move the king away. And wait a second, what's going on here? The bishop is protected by the king. This is no longer a fork. Uh, is there a difference between knight g5 and... Oh, yeah, not really. Knight g5 would be very straight. The only difference is that it wins another pawn. Why not, right? Why not take another pawn if you can? But in reality, uh, this is the same thing. Knight g5, knight e5 doesn't make a big difference. King f8, bishop b6, takes. Knight g5, king e7. But if you calculate a little bit further, if you try to anticipate just a couple more moves ahead, let's consider what happens if we take the bishop anyway. King takes the, the knight. But now this king is incredibly vulnerable. For a king to be vulnerable, it means it's in the center, it's unprotected. There's no pawn shell around it, so it's susceptible to all sorts of checks and potential mates. And it turns out that white has checkmate in three moves. Yeah, my opponents... So on my old, my other speedrun account, my name was stated on the page, but uh, chess.com is aware that I'm doing it and after what they refund the ratings of my opponents. Thank you, Griff Graham, for the five gifted. I appreciate it. So the move is queen g4 check. The king drops back to e7. That is forced. Queen takes g7 check, another check. King has to go back or forward, doesn't matter. And we give checkmate on f7. What is responsible for all of this existing? It's the rook on f1. So that's why the fantasy variation is so good. If we rewind all the way back to this trade, it might not seem like a significant trade, but it opens up the f file. It creates a semi-open file. That's responsible for all of these attacking ideas. All right. So for that reason, taking the bishop would have been impossible. Knight g f6 is a good attempt. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Bishop takes bishop, knight takes, knight g5 check, and this is totally crushing. The lesser evil would have been to give away the knight instead of giving away the queen. It wouldn't have helped. We still have a completely overwhelming attack, so this is totally crushing. And uh, the rest of the game I can go over, but it was very simple. Once we win the queen and support our center, the last thing I want to point out here, what would have happened if he takes this pawn on e4? How would we have responded if uh, if he had snapped off that pawn? One of the things you should ask yourself is, well, what squares are no longer under black's control? What squares are now accessible to us? Then you immediately should see queen g4. Four king, the knight, and the pawn on g7. This game is basically over. Um, so that's why we left this pawn hanging. Now we got our bishop out. We trade it. We got our knight out. We occupy the outpost on f5, uh, a very weak square. And now we go in for the final kill. We just win one of black's pieces and the rest is very easy. Uh, so the rest is easy. We take the bishop. We deliver a discovered double check against the king. The knight and the queen are both giving the check here. We drive the queen into d6, another intermediate move. Um... No, it's much more important to develop understanding than to memorize the opening. What if king e6 after the pawn fork? So if king e6, we can take the knight with a rook. So we take the knight with a rook, and the pawn protects the rook, so we're still going to win a piece here. Thank you, puns gifting to Monocor. Uh, so e5, dc, ed check, king d6, double check, driving the queen in, taking the knight. And now the checkmate in two moves. 
check driving the king to the corner and sliding the queen back to a3 delivering the checkmate um so select the truck pass um is it really interesting to occupy an outpost with a rook rather than a knight so generally speaking outposts are best occupied by knights that is true uh, however in this specific instance uh there were you know, basically extenuating circumstances because this pawn on e5, if you look at it, is being attacked by the rook. So there was a very specific reason to put the rook on an outpost. And if he takes, then we give a fork. If you wanted to put a knight on this outpost, you had to drag it through c4 and then e3 and then f5, and that would have been very possible. Uh, but I wanted to operate a little bit faster than that, okay? And that was what a speedrun game looks like. Now, generally speaking, we don't analyze speedrun games nearly with this level of detail but uh since we had a charlie red and stuff today was an exception once again uh there's tons of speedrun videos on youtube and uh, you're welcome to help yourselves to that all right guys i'm pretty exhausted i i know we've got still got a big crowd but i'm going to give somebody a big rate i'm i'm uh going to hit the sack um and i'll be back tomorrow i in preparation for the tournament i'm trying to uh, keep a slightly more responsible schedule. Uh, so I hope that's okay with everybody. Again, it's a pleasure to see so many of you from Charlie's stream sticking around. Really, it's awesome. Uh, so I really appreciate it, guys. Uh, and all of the support today. It's been awesome. I hope you had a great Memorial Day. And uh, yeah, thank you. The, the, the feedback from the speedrun is always very heartwarming. <laughs>